Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on the show, the end of capitalism? Maybe, says author Paul Mason. Plus, journalist Patrick Coburn on the latest news on ISIS. And a few words from me on what is missing from pride. Welcome to The Laura Flanders Show, where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the ones who are doing it. A new way of living is in the process of formation. Capitalism, as we know it, has reached the limits of its ability to adapt. A networked alternative is already in the works. You can see it in the cooperative businesses we report on on this program, and in the very tough time traditional parties are having keeping old hierarchies in place. There is no more exciting or important story to report on. That's what I think. Paul Mason agrees. He's economics editor at Channel 4 News in the United Kingdom. He joined us often from the front lines of the anti-austerity rebellions in Europe and the Middle East after the financial crash of 2008. Now he's out with a new book, Post-Capitalism, A Guide to Our Future, just published by Farrell Strauss Giroux. Welcome back, Paul. Great to have you. It's nice to be here. Here and in the flesh. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so we could geek out on the on the <laughs> economics in your book, which is like an education in itself. But I want to start with the politics that we're in right now. Um, how do you see this post-capitalist scenario playing out in our election debacle? <laughs> Look, part, part of the uh, uh, analysis in the book is about why elites, why hierarchies are falling apart. But there's a very clear reason why the U.S political elite and hierarchy is falling apart, it's because the economic model doesn't work. So it all, you know, it, I'm afraid it does lead back to the geekery of economics. Why doesn't what we call the neoliberal model work anymore? And that's what I've tried to explain in the book. Now, on top of that, uh, we have here, you know, a networked generation, a young generation, you hear them at, at Bernie Sanders rallies, um, but you can actually trace them right the way back through Occupy, through the people who mobilized for Obama's uh, initial campaign, right the way through back to Howard Dean. You know, Howard Dean was the first Democrat to take seriously networked politics. So I think you know, what we're seeing with the Sanders campaign is very much a, a product of a sudden rise of networked politics. The question is, of course, where does it go? after the nominations are concluded. So if, we, if neoliberalism was still working, um, what would be happening? What would we be seeing differently from what we're seeing now? Look, every 50 years or so, capitalism goes through a mutation. It's so different by the end of the mutation that it doesn't look like the capitalism that came before. You know, here in New York City, just look up, or any of the cities of America, you see buildings built during the last great period of expansion, either the, the 1940s and 50s, or the period just before the First World War, the Teddy Roosevelt era. And in those periods, what happens? New jobs come along to replace old ones that are being automated. These new jobs, if labor fights hard enough, are often better paid. You also get new needs. So uh, radio replaces vaudeville. Right. The, the movies replace vaudeville. This is just not happening now, and I trace the reason right back to information. Information is a different kind of technological revolution. It produces cheap stuff or free stuff and, and, and it tends to push wages down because it automates without creating the new jobs that we usually see at this phase in the cycle of the economy. You're saying that the information technology and the economy based around, uh, around information is really a different animal altogether to the kinds of technologies we've seen before? Yeah, look, I, I could, uh, we, we could if we really wanted to, a, a bit of industrial anthropology, yeah. we could go out to the nearest place from here where there's a lot of small engineering factories, and I guarantee you we'd be, we would find machines in those places, jealously hoarded, probably going right back to the 1950s. Every time I go to a factory, that's, it's a great moment. You see an old piece of material. Okay, um, Information doesn't work like that. Information revolutionises... Information is only machines, uh, software is a machine, a computer is a machine, a silicon chip is a machine. It revolutionizes the efficiency and the price falls off a cliff. Mm. So the price of one million transistors, transistors printed on a silicon chip in 1992 was $222 and it's now six cents. Mm. And you think, so what? Well, that one million transistors was what we used to call a 486 computer, a Pentium 4. Yeah, you might remember that. Yeah. yeah? So, so effectively, a Pentium 4's processing power is now free. And that means 
you know, we don't need to hoard the Pentium yeah. for. It's, it's a different kind of technological revolution. I think it's as big as, as the printing press. It's yeah, I mean, that you big. say in your book that it transforms our relationship to wages, to land, to labor, to all of the traditional things that have been the deciding factors in economics. Well, it's not just me who says that. There's a very strong uh, school of thought in, inside mainstream economics that discovered this more or less as soon as we discovered the command C, command V. Uh, you know, you can produce, reproduce things for free with very little energy, very little labor. Uh, what the economists who studied that said, look, this stuff is going to end up free. And I think for the last 25 years, we've seen business models uh, react to that fact by working out ever more clever ways to make stuff that should or could be free very expensive. Give us an example. 99 cents a track on iTunes. Now, I have to say to your audience, remember that. But when I started writing the book, that's what it was, yeah. in the sense that if you have a 95% market share, you can set the price of something that could be reproduced for free uh, at 99 cents, in, irrespective of supply, demand, quality. The whole model of iTunes was, was based on making stuff that could be very, very cheap or free quite expensive. What happened to it? Well, the sharing sites came along. and. In the UK, we have Spotify, Deezer, I don't know, everyone that, that there's in the, U, in the USA. But what, what's the outcome? The, the, the amount of money you earn as a, as a music artist dramatically falls yeah. once competition kicks in. Because you're, if you're creating something that you can only defend with lawyers. Now, lawyers, you know, it's, lawyers are a part of capitalism. But anything that has to be completely reproduced by law every morning with an insistence, take this down, you can't copy this is not the same capitalism as the kind of capitalism that functions spontaneously, almost kind of without lawyers and without a state. And, and then the last other option that I think doesn't come in for so much attention in your book, but I think we're seeing very much here, is war. I mean, war's always been a good engine, right yep. after land and labor. Mm. We have war to keep our capitalism yeah. going. We do have an awful lot of wars, and then if we're not using those tools, those weapons abroad, we tend to bring them back onto our streets. Yep. Um, why won't that save capitalism? Well, I think it's, it's a qu what we're looking for here is, look, we've had, you know, we're in the middle of the biggest tech innovation boom ever. I mean, literally, our, our command, our power over nature and ourselves is greater than ever, because, thanks to technology. And, and the world economy is stagnating. Now, the USA had a few good years because of uh, the Federal Reserve's quantitative easing program and the ease with which you can create very cheap labor, precarious jobs, I would argue. But that's not, that, again, that's not a takeoff. And central bankers all over the world, I mean, America is the exception here, all over the world, central bankers are terrified of stagnation, negative interest rates. I mean, negative interest rates mean that the, ba the safest form of capital doesn't earn any money. Mm. It, to, it costs you, you know, to, to store a dollar uh, costs you a, you know, co cost you a cent. You come back with 99 cents, come what may, mm. no matter what risk you have taken there. So it's not working. And I think that the, you know, what is coming down the tracks, I mean, you say war, I mean, I'm more concerned about geopolitical instability and breakup. Mm. I think sooner or later, it's happening now. You know, one or other developed country will, will, will head for the exit of the mm. global system and say, look, our own people can't stand this any longer, and therefore we're going to do some very traditional things, such as uh, Roosevelt did in 1933. We're going to you know, shore up our own banking system, kind of already done across the world. We're going to look after our own people. We're going to put trade barriers up against... It's usually posed as other people dumping their stuff mm. on us. So, OK, I think we've covered the territory. Now we get to the exciting part, which is if we were to see the upside of the post capitalist world, not just the nasty ructions of the dying system, um, what might we find? What, might we, what have you been looking at? Well, I think there is already a post-capitalist sector of the economy, and we could segment it either vertically or horizontally. Let's look vertically. In the Spanish region of Catalonia, since the 2008 crash, we, there is a good academic study that shows how many ordinary people had to fall back on collaborative, unpaid, sharing kind of free production uh, as a result simply of the fact that there was no other way to live. Uh, the welfare system was falling apart. There's no welfare anywhere. There's no jobs. Um, 
the sociologist Manuel Castells, who studied this, found that one in three people in that region had lent people money at zero interest who were non-family members, or they'd participated in uh, time banks, so volunteering, or uh, collaborative community creches. Often in a country, in Southern Europe, agriculture is really easy in a hot country, people literally just go back to the land. This is happening right now in Italy. There's a big movement of unemployed young people who are saying, enough with the urban life, trying to wait tables and three, juggle three jobs. Uh, I, if I'm going to be poor, let's be poor on grandmother's village in a mountain where it's beautiful. Yeah. And, and let's do painting and poetry. So, so no, I don't think that's the route to the future. But we do see, you know, we have enabled, uh, as it were, in the physical world, ourselves to collaborate better. And the technology is important because, of course, there's a technological equivalent of all this kind of commune stuff, which is Wikipedia, Linux, Apache, a load of a load of other open sharing. open source software and even products yeah. that people produce as a kind of gift, in the hope that a gift will come back to them. It's it's almost a replica of the early gift economies that anthropologists found in in your kind of far flung islands in the South Pacific. We don't have a, a whole lot more time, but a couple of questions left. One is, what role does the state play in any of this? Um, it used to be socialists would talk about central yeah. planning and industrial planning. Um, in the networked world that you're describing, does the state have yeah. a role still? The reason I wrote this book, above all, is observing the movements of 2011 here in Spain, in Greece, in, in the UK, and, and realizing that sooner or later they would move from street activism and look for holistic answers. And if you look at what they've tended to do, they've tended to choose symbolic old guy. Okay, symbolic old honest socialist guy, which is in uh, the USA, Sanders, in Britain, Jeremy Corbyn. Um, all these people are, you know, you know, I think, honest and sincere politicians, but their socialism is the socialism of, of what we call the Keynesian era, the 60s and 70s, very state orientated. I don't think it translates well economically to the world that we need to build. We need to build on small scale production, startups, a mixture of uh, non profits, you can credit mm. unions. Now, the kind of credit union, non-profit, start-up, collaborative crash thing isn't really very high in the mix for the, the, the old left. And I think that, in, in other words, it's what we do ourselves rather than what we keep asking the state to do mm -hmm. in the short term. But at the, the scale of the crisis you know, will demand some very, very um, orthodox, old-fashioned left measures from the state because you know, quantitative easing is, is uh, the central bank isn't independent. It's an arm of the state. I think, however, there's going to still be a role for the state to do some very orthodox kind of old left measures. Quantitative easing is actually one of them. Right now, central banks are discussing what do we buy next. Mm. Um, in Europe, they think, you know, they've, they've already bought the, the debt of companies. They're thinking about buying the, the shares of companies. Yeah. Now, my argument there is, look, let's get together, let's network, let's decide our own agenda. If you can, if you can buy Volkswagen's debt, you could buy every auto loan in the country and write it off. You could write off every student loan because we're talking about billions here. This is a new form of state intervention. Mm. Um, it's not free, it doesn't come without cost, but it's the kind of thing I think we're gonna to have to do given the scale of the stagnation that's coming down the line. But there is a political reality and you report on a lot of it in this book and in your other books. Um, you were in Gaza under the bombardment of, of the Israelis. Uh, you were in Greece following the kind of crushing of, of Syriza's mm. agenda. Um, what is the, what is your conclusion having witnessed those situations mm. and others? I've spoken to people involved in the Syriza fight who just said, sure, Europe was a problem, mm. but our problems were also internal. Well, yeah, of course. I'll say one thing, actually, about the parallel between those two situations. Obviously, you can't draw any parallel between a war and a simple economic crisis. But when you're sitting, sitting under a bombardment and you think nobody in the world cares about you and there's no, you know, nobody in the world really does care and you're powerless, it did feel quite like that to sit in Greece when the European Union had switched off its banking system. Yeah. Day one was fine, day three a bit stressful. Day 10 was very, very stressful. People were suddenly bursting to tears for no reason. Quite ordinary, strong people. And I think that we are up against, I think, you know, we, we are up you know, against the global banking system has the financial and economic equivalent of Gaza to throw out any movement that wants to defy it. But I think, sure, Syriza made some mistakes. The mistake they made, Tsipras says to me in the documentary I made about him, we didn't fight 
soon enough. Yeah. Um, they didn't take seriously enough the threat that the Germans were going to smash them and, 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 and literally subject 10 million people to, to possible starvation. But they also say on the inside, we had systems that have been working the old way for generations. Yeah. It's not so easy to flip it around while you're in yeah. mid-flight. Yeah, exactly. And that's the, that's the case. Funnily enough, Syriza had a whole department that was interested in the stuff I'm interested in, the collaborative economy, the you know, wiring networks, villages you know, for free, all this. It, the, 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 the actual guy in charge of that whole project got made head of the uh, state energy company because they had to throw everything at what there was. What's the lesson? I mean, it is a lesson I think the American left can learn because you have the far left, very hierarchical, very fixed in its old ways. You've got Sanders quite from that old, old left tradition. The, and, the, the, and yet the mass base of the Sanders movement, of Corbyn in Britain, of uh, Podemos in uh, Spain, is not really interested in some of those things. It's interested in struggling itself yeah. and bringing its own power to make incremental change. And I think we have to, I think the people in the middle, the kind of, the, the core, the, the, the organizers, need to, need to stop, in America above all, need to stop flip-flopping between one day I'm a kind of person in Zuccotti Park under a tent, and the next minute I'm kind of with my little laptop and my Obama sticker or Sanders sticker or Howard Dean sticker. I'm playing the game of the normal politics. There's got to be somewhere in between. And I think my, the, the, the economics and the politics that are in my book are an attempt to arm yeah. people with what that in-between is. Ah, it's great talking to you. Paul Mason's new book is Post-Capitalism, A Guide to Our Future. Check it out. We'll make a link available at our website. Great to see you. Yeah, so to you. ISIS has been sustaining defeats across Iraq and Syria in recent months, but that doesn't necessarily mean that peace is looming. In part, that's because the Middle East's wars are as much about politics as they are about military prowess. Longtime Middle East correspondent Patrick Coburn is the author of a new book, Chaos and Caliphate, Jihadis and the West in the Struggle for the Middle East. I had a chance to talk with him about some of the themes in the new book earlier this year in his home in Ireland. Here's Patrick. Bring us up to date, Patrick. What, what, what's happening that we should understand about Syria these days? The Syrian army has retaken Palmyra, the ancient city in eastern Syria, and uh, defeated Islamic State in that area, which is very important because um, it's one of the biggest defeats that Islamic State has suffered uh, when Islamic State first arose in 2014, one of its uh, one of the things which propelled it forward was the idea it always won victories thanks to divine assistance. Then there was a line which was largely propaganda um, in the Gulf states, in the US and Europe, which said that the Syrian army and Assad never fought Islamic State. Now this was actually demonstrably untrue, and one could see this from the horrible videos that ISIS made, Islamic State made, showing Syrian soldiers being decapitated and shot in the head in 2014 and 2015. But that was a very widespread belief. And then when the Russian air intervention started on the 30th of September, there was another, what was essentially mostly propaganda, there was some substance in it, but saying that uh, the Russians were only attacking moderate rebels. Nobody knows where these moderate rebels are. Was not attacking Islamic State. So the capture of Palmyra by the Syrian army and the Russians uh, is important because it shows that actually they are fighting Islamic State, uh, and this is the biggest uh, defeat suffered by the organization. You've been following the campaign. What do you make of the way that American candidates for president talk about the crisis? And well, uh, you know, what strikes one about so Hillary Clinton, all the Republican candidates, actually with a, perhaps the exception of Trump, um, is it's based on wishful thinking and often just fantasy of what they could do or what they have done. I mean, Hillary Clinton's record is not good. She was in favor of the Iraq War in 2003. She was very importantly favored the Libyan intervention in 2011, though Obama seems to have had doubts about it. Uh, she was in favor of intervening in Syria in 2013. So it's very much a sort of traditional 
you know, liberal with a small L, interventionist. The, um, you know, the, the Republican candidates talk about Trump in a minute. Generally, it's sort of fantasy. And they, they accuse Hillary of the one thing she didn't do, which is really the re responsibility for the U.S. ambassador getting killed in Benghazi. Almost everything else she got wrong is the one thing that she didn't really, doesn't have direct responsibility for. Um, but that's all sort of based on fantasy. They would tear up the agreement with Iran. They would give full backing in every way to Israel. They would um, intervene against uh, Assad. You know, some of these things aren't obvious. You know, Hillary, for instance, in favor of safe zones in Syria. Sounds nice, safe zones for civilians. But hold on a minute. These safe zones, who's going to police them? Well, it might be the Turkish army or the Turks saying they will be policed by Syrian armed moderates. But who? The, you then have to realize the Turkish definition of a moderate includes people like al-Nusra, which is the al-Qaeda representative in Syria. Which is So a lot of these things um, are, are much more toxic than they look. And finally, you know, you've got two things happening at once. You've got, this, you've got the ISIS security question. You've also got this um, migration, refugee crisis. Borders are reappearing in Europe. Um, what, what are you What are you making of all this? Like, how do you both secure well, yeah. security and not and allow refugees to move? Well, you know, this was two thousand and fifteen that finally the calamity that's happened to the Syrian and the Iraqi people suddenly is having an effect on Europe, and it's happening its its effect through two ways. One is these poor migrants struggling across the Aegean to get to uh, Western Europe, and also terror attacks in Paris and Brussels and so forth. So suddenly it's become a big issue. And very little said, well, how come that we let this happen? Our government, governments don't want to talk why this happened. They want to emote and have protest marches, but not actually say, well, actually, a lot of things we did was we created this situation by letting the war, in, giving support to one side in the civil war in Syria and uh, so forth. Many places around the world are celebrating LGBTQ pride this month, and lots of them had become a fairly routine part of the calendar until the deadly attack on the Orlando Gay Nightclub. In a tragic way, that attack has given this year's event some of its old significance. Pride in the streets wasn't always a ho-hum thing. In my experience, early pride marches were defiant, riotous affairs, often complete with many riots. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans people striding out of the closet and into the streets it was a brave, dramatic deal. We'd boo the bigotry of the church and the state and risk arrest over AIDS and murder. And then many of us who marched in the 80s started to skip it. I did. The monster floats had become so large and loud, and the people's banners so few and scrawny. Commerce seemed to have edged out community. And then there was the year that U.S. service people led the parade, the morning after a deadly U.S. bombing strike on Baghdad, Iraq. I didn't feel pride that year. I felt confused. Had liberation pride lost out to piece of the pie pride, such that we were now celebrating our place in war and killing? That revolution I found hard to dance to. I didn't marry, but I did couple up. I started missing pride and not thinking much about it. But a few months ago, a friend asked for my thoughts for a book she was compiling called Pride and Joy. The gifts I've received from pride parades are many. They're present in the freedom I feel, holding my lover's hand and kissing just about anywhere, in the image I have in my head of a massive rainbow of lives flowing down Fifth Avenue in New York, and the glimpse I got then and still see from time to time of a rambunctious, grand, queer festival of fun and fight that's seductive enough to overcome haters' fears and smart enough to embrace all our movements. At its best, Pride is a chance to meet and mourn and resurrect the parts of ourselves we keep cooped up. Also, to practice stepping off our safe private places on the pavement and into the mad helter-skelter on the street. I marched before, and maybe I'll march again, to be reminded of the joy that is in the mix of singular, special people in a cavorting common crowd, defiant, brave, and dancing, different together. There's still plenty plenty to mourn and more to fight for and win and we could all of us do with a lot more dancing happy pride everyone
This week on the show, Seattle's Socialist City Councilwoman, Shama Sawant. There will be a wave of demoralization if Bernie Sanders simply turns around and says, you know, you all supported me because you hate the corporate establishment. Now I'm going to tell you to support that very corporate establishment. Plus, alternative energy expert Yanis Magoris. The European Union has not hasn't found a way of getting out of the crisis in a social and democratic and just way. Puerto Rico is being strangled with debt. What's the solution? 300,000 people have left Puerto Rico in the last 10 years and there's projections that there may be 600,000 um, in this decade between 2010 and 2020. They buy up the debt for really cheap prices, and then they do everything in their power to make your life a living hell. Later, we visit with the urban bushwomen, and you'll get a few words from me on Yale's aversion to paying more taxes. Mm -hmm.